if the underground manufacturer wasn't as careful at creating the same compound, then there might be differences in how the, the drug is absorbed and distributed. And so in theory, an underground made version might need to be dosed more frequent if it's not of the same pharmacology as a real pharmaceutical ah, version. Because yeah. the pharmacokinetics yes. are affected yes. and the half-life is shorter. Uh, yep. Correct. Dean, maybe talk about um, the different dosing protocol for the GLPs, the compounded stuff versus the the pharma stuff. You did okay. a post on Instagram, right? So it wasn't even. There, there's obviously the, the debate both sides. One is on about microdosing. One's mm -hmm. on about macrodosing. There's no debate. Um, <laughs> you know, there's no debate. We don't listen I, to chiropractors. I I, I think. <laughs> I think uh, what I wanted to do is present both sides on, mm -hmm. yeah, maybe there's for and, and against to both sides. Macro dosing, you're going to see a bigger occupation of, of uh, the receptors very quickly in terms of mm -hmm. Cmax, which could bring adverse events, which is in theory the appetite suppression. And then the other side of it is if you microdose, you're offsetting C max mm -hmm. in that period of time of, of absorption. But from a, a pharmacokinetics perspective, by the time you get to the to the half life of the, the compound, like five half lives, steady state concentration in theory is achieved. But in saying that, I mean they've been studied with one injection per week, mm -hmm. but that's how we have to view these drugs were designed for, I don't like saying it, but unhealthy people mm -hmm. to speak. And injection like, convenience, just like Nibido. You go to the correct. doctor, yep. so, one shot every 12 weeks, first four weeks, you're great. And the last so, eight weeks, you're like, oh. Well, there's also a chemical difference between the compounded and the so pharma stuff. In, in terms of like, when, when we look at potentially the pharmaceutically made GLPs versus mm -hmm. what is made um, underground, if you want to call it that. They could still be in theory from a pharmaceutical facility. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of these, like a lot of drugs have some level of patent protection in terms of how they are delivered. There is, mm -hmm. you know, some level of absorption matrix associated with the compound, which favors how well it stays in the body. And we know with, for example, trisepatide over retitrutide, uh, we have this aspect linker on the peptide, which enhances stability. Um, if the underground manufacturer wasn't as careful at creating the same compound, then there might be differences in how the, the drug is absorbed and distributed versus the underground versus pharmaceutical. Mm -hmm. And so in theory, an underground made version might need to be dosed more frequent if it's not of the same pharmacology as a real pharmaceutical ah, version. Because yeah. the pharmacokinetics yes. are affected yeah. and the half-life is shorter. Uh, yep. Correct. That, so, okay. That's what I, I'm saying. Uh, is the studies on the pharmacy? Fair point. Yeah, I, I didn't take that into consideration. I, I can't argue for again. Both of them make sense, to be honest. This is where I don't think one is wrong over the other. But we know, obviously, how it's been studied. These unhealthy populations may have some level of glucagon. Uh, well, not glucagon. Even the the GLP receptor could be internalized, so it is a cell surface receptor like insulin in unhealthy populations in like type one diabetics or even type two, you might need to dose this once per week to get a big high C max in order to see an effect from the drug. And that, that effect, I guess <clears throat> at week, like five, six of these compounds, the outcome is HPA and C control, like controlling blood mm -hmm. sugar stabilization. The appetite suppression is technically a side effect of the drug. It's not, yep. yes, it's been repurposed to be the primary outcome for 
obese people who, who may or may not have type 2 diabetes. But dosing it in that large bolus might actually cause issues for a metabolically healthy person who yep. may need to dose it less frequently or dose it more frequently, but at a much lower dose, yep. sort of microdosing. Which one, uh, which one is the correct way again? Compliance, yeah. safety. If you do like, not to create dosages, but let's say you do two and a half milligrams of retitrutide or two milligrams of terzepatide, you try and mirror what the, the clinical studies have. And that for, for that person who has like, I don't know, eight to 10% body fat, that it just makes them completely nauseous, causes pain and uh, paralysis of their, you know, smooth muscle of the mm -hmm. intestine, then they might benefit from going to a lower dose whereby the appetite suppression is still present, but it's not to the extent that it's causing ad adversity. Um, and you're still getting maybe some of the, the GLP-1 response of improving pancreatic control of insulin, et cetera. So it wasn't, my, my post wasn't like one's right, one's wrong. There's arguments for and against, but like Kurt brought up, I wanted to highlight when you look at the research on the pharmaceutically made compound of how it's been engineered, that, uh, I forget now what, what you call it exactly, but the, the part of the polymer that's coming off mm -hmm. the, the GLP aspect is what is making it resistant to DP4. Mm -hmm. So in, right. in mm -hmm. terms of- yeah. Yeah. The dipeptidyl peptidase 4 nice enzymes, point. which cleave that metabolize yeah. these kinds of hormones. What I would also like to contribute is that these people that are uh, in the studies, right, there are higher body fat levels. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you guys have noticed that with insulin, for example, if you take five IUs post-workout, your 20% body fat, your <laughs> blood glucose levels are not as affected as when you take them at 8% body mm -hmm. fat, five IUs. Because the dispersion and the absorption at a lower body fat percentage is significantly higher. So if you take a pharmaceutical compound at 25% body fat once per week, maybe the the curve of absorption is significantly mm -hmm. different compared to microdosing lower dosages multiple times per week because you have low body fat levels and you use it purely for appetite control because you can control your hemoglobin A1C and your blood glucose and because you live the lifestyle. Yep. So I, I think maybe a bolus dose is better for fatties. Yep. And microdosing is better for people who are actually in shape and use this for yeah, appetite yeah. suppression because you don't want too much appetite suppression. Because I remember when Liraglutide came out, I used a pharmaceutical brand of it, but that's the only thing that was available. We didn't have generics of Liraglutide at that time, three, four years ago. So I got the pharmaceutical version, paid an arm and a leg, um, and, and I would dose that six days a week and skip it on Sunday, because on Sunday I wouldn't get too much appetite suppression, so I could have my refeed. Mm -hmm. And this seemed to work quite well. Now with these longer acting, duloglutide, semiglutide, trisepidide, retroglutide, obviously you can't skip a day or two um, because it's still active. It has a multiple day half-life. But it seems that with the micro dosages, you don't have to suffer through these nauseating effects, which a lot of people experience with uh, bolus injections, especially at lower body fat levels. So like the first couple of days, you're just knocked out. Good luck doing a heavy squat. Good luck doing leg presses mm -hmm. or reverse hyperextensions or, or uh, what is it, uh, uh, you know, glute work where you have a barbell in your chest, uh, in, your, in your stomach. Um, it j just presses your stomach too much and you can't even train properly. So I, I would always favor towards microdose just simply from a, you know, a, a management perspective. Mm -hmm. Minimal side effects, maximum results. Uh, but a bolus injection for fatties, yeah, and, and they don't know how to inject and they use the audio, auto injector. I had the two milligram semiglutide or the one and a half milligram duloglutide. Sure, go for it. But I don't identify as a fatty. Yeah. No, you I was know? just, I wanted Dean to talk about it because I was just trying to point out the differences so people could understand, right? right? So you're looking at obese people with the pharma grade, right? And what's happening when your body fat's over 15 or much higher, there's chronic inflammation, right? So the phospholipid layer of the cell doesn't allow that receptor to go to the surface as easy. That's why one of the reasons why the bigger dose will work 
better than a fat person. Also, microdosing simply because it gets absorbed so slowly. (laughs) You have more steady state release. (laughs) I just want people to understand the difference. It's almost like an ester attach, right? The difference between the pharma GLP and the underground potentially similar to growth hormone, right? It's the same parent thing, but it's just made into a different process. So it's not going to react the same way. At the cell. Yeah, the delivery mechanism is different. Yeah, I mean, everybody who, who who's tried the liraglutide or the diloglutide or the semiglutide pens compared to underground lab, there's a unique smell. Yeah. And it's the same with growth hormone, uh, insulin. Some brands may have a unique smell, some just smell like nothing. Uh, but that's the additional ingredients that help with the delivery. Yep. Uh, it, it, it contributes a little bit to the aroma, basically. Uh, and you're injecting that. But yeah, with, with peptides, it's a couple binders and... and probably not of the patented ingredients that help with the pharmacodynamics or kinetics. 